So let's go ahead and start. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful that we can gather together and study your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to conform to it. Help us, Lord, not to fight it. Help us, Lord, to just break free of traditions and things that aren't ungodly, things that, that don't conform with what it is you say. Uh, help us to ever change our theology to uh, reflect your word, even if it challenges long-standing beliefs, Lord. And I just ask, God, that we would make your word the sole rule and guide for our lives. And we just say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up. Oh, you are here. Open up to... You were just a mistake. Thanks, brother. Ashton, that's what matters. Oh, I'm just kidding. It's okay. Ashton can find some other spot. He can worship somewhere else. He doesn't have to be in the I can chair. Sure. No, I'm good. This is good because then I can lean back. If you have your Bibles, please open to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 just to get a little bit of uh, Bible reading in. As we talk, we've been talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement and all that stuff. So this is our third lecture on the subject. And today we're going to be talking about what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we've looked at different positions throughout church history as far as what different people believed about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And today I'm hoping to do some work to talk about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Does everybody have it? Do you get it at conversion? Do you not get it at conversion? Is it delayed? There, are, These are things that have been debated, particularly in the last hundred years. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy for the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to god for no one understands him but he utters mysteries in the spirit on the other hand the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their upbuilding and encouragement of and uh, consolation the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself but the one who prophesies builds up the church now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. All right, so we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is going to feed into it because it's going to feed in what's the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does everybody speak in tongues? That kind of thing. Uh, but last two times I was with you, I talked about the different positions on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the different cat and the different types of people who believe different things, which I've already covered. But there was one. How many? Well, let me ask you this: How many waves of Pentecostalism or Charismatic? Three, four, four, four. four. One, two, and three, and then four. And what are the four waves? What's the first one? First wave. <laughs> Pentecostal, and that happened in 1906. And then the second wave is what's called the New Pentecostal. New Pentecostal, that they called it that. It went by another variety of names, and it was called the Charismatic Renewal Movement. And, and third wave is called Third Wave. Sometimes, sometimes it's called the Signs and Wonders. That's where the vineyard movement well, that's came out better. Of. You Sometimes, that. but it was just really called the third wave. Because uh, signs and wonders movement went, goes a little bit crazy, and a lot of people in the third wave did not go a little crazy. And the fourth wave is called nothing but fourth wave. Because we're, we're still in the middle of this fourth wave. Now, these are not three denominations or four denominations. Don't think of it like that. Don't think, well, this is a denomination. No, these are movements in which... Um, in which um, renewed interest in the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been experienced. Okay, so these are renewed uh, interests. Now, during the fourth wave, the only thing that I said that kind of is holding it together is what? What's the only thing really that's kind of, you can say anything really sure about the fourth wave? The academic. Academic, academic right? It's very academic. And But you have people feeding in from all these waves uh, in different waves, in different ways, sorry, 
but what's happening is they're producing a lot of academic work. So they're writing the theological work. So you have Pentecostals writing theological works on why they're Pentecostals and really wanting people to know that this isn't just crazy experiential, that, these are, that, these, that there's a good reason why we believe this. And the charismatic's the same and the third wave the same. The third wave seems to be the biggest part of this fourth wave. Now there's one more position, when I talked about the position, there's one more position that I failed to mention last week. How dare you forget to mention that position? I know, I know. <laughs> and that is, I've mentioned it before, but I didn't mention it in this series of lectures. So remember we have, uh, we have cessationists, right? The cessationists, what do they believe about the gifts? They're gone. They're gone. They've ceased. So they do not believe in the gifts as gifts. But we said there are two types of cessationists. What are they? Hardline and soft cell. Hardline and and soft cell. Soft cell, right? Soft cell cessationists. And what's the difference between the two? Do you remember? So hardline says it's done. It's done, you know, very much the gifts are over. Uh, everybody who is a Christian has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what you get. The only gifts that are really gifts for today are gifts like teaching and administration and giving and hospitality. But the charismatic gifts are done away with. Now, they will say that the, that gifts of healing still might happen, but nobody has them as a gift. They're not gifts anymore. So you can pray for somebody's healing and somebody might get healed, but there are no gifts, so, but it's not a gift. Now, theologically, the soft cells are the same. They have the same theology. They believe the same thing, but they also, but they believe they're just more open to the movement of the spirit. So uh, a soft cell will say something like, like, yes, I believe theologically the gift, especially the gift of prophecy is over, but... Um, you know, the Holy Spirit told me to come to this church today, or the Holy Spirit moved on me to come. They, they still believe in the promptings of the Holy Spirit, not, but not that they, they, they just don't like that word prophecy. That just gets caught in their throat. They don't like that word prophecy at all. But theologically, they believe that they have a case that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ended. Now, right next door, and this actually kind of comes out of this fourth wave movement, is another position. And the other position is called open but cautious open but cautious and a soft cell and an open but cautious are almost identical the difference is is their theology an open but cautious person they understand that they do not have a biblical case as to why the gifts have ceased they, there's because there's not a biblical case as to why as i will show in due course but the open but cautious group says, well, I know that I don't have a verse that says that the gifts have ceased. I know that there's no theological argumentation, but I function kind of as a cessationist. I, 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 I don't see that what's going on here is what happened at Pentecost. I don't see what's going on here is what happened in the first century. So they're open, but they're, they're cautious. They say, I don't have a verse that says that I can close the can or not close the canon but close the gifts of the holy spirit close prophecy close tongues but if you ask me nine times out of ten when somebody says they've had a healing or when somebody says they've had a word eh, i tend not to believe them i tend not to so open but cautious really the only two things that happens here is their theology but they'll be open they'll be like well you know the, the bible doesn't say that it's closed and uh or that the gifts have ceased but i just don't function that way all right, so what did we say each one of these believe about the gift of, or the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And then we'll get down to some, uh, well, some newer stuff. So what do Pentecostals believe about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember? Yeah, what? Conversion? It's, no. No, no, it's a sign. <laughs> it's a sign. It's a, okay, all right, but or it happens. It's an event that the sign is. Does it happen at conversion or no? No, after. no after. but I'll give you something. It happens after conversion. It's now, some yeah, now, yes, and sometimes, sometimes the Pentecostal position is that the is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens post conversion after you're already saved. Sometimes it can happen when you're saved, but it doesn't have to. It's post conversion, uh, and then the sign that you 
been baptized in the Holy Spirit is what? Tongues. Is tongues. And that's true for about 95%. 95% believe that tongues is the sign. So like I said, if you would go to a Pentecostal church, uh, Church of God, Cleveland, Church of God, Anderson, the, the Assemblies of God, they will say, if you do not speak in tongues, you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. End of story. That's it. End of story. Some exceptions to this are uh, the Foursquare Church. The Foursquare Church says, if you do not speak in tongues, you more than likely haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But there are rare exceptions. Okay. So what's the, what's the charismatic position on the gifts, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Tongues is not. May not be. May not be. And that changed because when the, when the charismatic uh, renewal movement hit, it came over just as Pentecostalism. But this 95% started to grow to like 90% and then it grew to 85%. It's really tough to put a number on, but you don't have to. But does it happen? Does it happen at conversion or post-conversion? Yeah. Post. 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 Oh, it can happen at. Some people do. But more than likely, you get saved first, then later you get baptized with the Holy Spirit. So then the third wave is what? At conversion and everything. Oh, you've been at saying this whole time. Yeah, at conversion. The third wave is at conversion. Baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at conversion. And is, son is tongues the sign? No. No. You may speak in tongues. You may not speak in tongues. You may be saved and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Ten years later, you might speak in tongues. It's not the sign. There's no, there's no sign. Fourth wave, like I said, is all across the board. We will leave that because we're in the midst of the fourth wave. Okay, so what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What is it? And um, well, what's the Bible say about it? Well, let's start. Let me start with the statement, and then I'll seek to justify the statement through the Bible. Okay, I'll, I'll start with the statement, then I'll seek to justify that statement. The statement is that in the that under the old covenant, you may or may not have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and there was a transition period from the old covenant to the new covenant, where you had some delays in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But now today, for the most part, and the teaching on it, if you are saved, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay? So number one, what I want to, what I, does that make sense? Do you have any questions on that? No. Okay, so once the new covenant has been taken over and the old covenant has gone away with, um, salvation as it's administered under the new covenant is everybody has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we get down to what it means. However, first of all, we have to say that number one, that you can't, that not today, but there was a time when people were saved. What do we mean by saved? I'm going to heaven, right? I, I mean, go ahead and answer. <laughs> going to heaven. They're saved. They're genuine believers. They're Christians. They're going to go to heaven. That there was a time when they were saved, but did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, there, there, that happens in Scripture. Okay, there are people who are saved, but did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, for example, turn to um, Acts, not Acts, turn to John chapter 7. And verse 37. Now, were the disciples saved, with the exception of Judas, Judas Iscariot? Were they Christians? Yes. Were they yes. believers? Yes. yes, they were believers. So look at John chapter 7 and verse 37. It says, On the day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of him will flow rivers of living water. Now he said about he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So you had these people who were saved, and so they believed in Christ, they believed he was the Messiah, but yet they had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now for a minute here, you're going to think, well, 
um, sounding like a Pentecostal. A Pentecostal believes that it comes later. And this is, this is the kind of thing that they would point to. This is the kind of case that they would make. Now, there's a reformed complication Because reformed people, what's the fourth point of Calvinism? Perseverance. No, that's no. the fifth point. Oh, 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 irresistible. irresistible grace. And irresistible grace says that re, what? Re generation. generation precedes, precedes. Precedes what? Salvation. Precedes, well, precedes, I, would, I would probably say faith. Faith. Regeneration precedes faith. So this means that before anybody can express faith in Christ, or faith in, in God, uh, the true God of the Bible, that God has to first remove the stony heart out of, out of that person. So we would say that the Holy Spirit has already done this in the lives of many people who've come to faith. So turn to, um, turn. now this is where I dropped the ball. Personally speaking, this is where I got hung up because I thought, well, if I'm saved, that means the Holy Spirit has come and taken that heart of stone out and put a heart of faith and given me a heart of flesh. But that, but everybody in the Old Testament experienced that. And that was way before Acts chapter 2. So uh, turn to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 16. And in verse 13, this is where Christ asks, you know, who people say I am. And he says, then who do you say that I am? And Peter answers in verse 16. So 16, 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has revealed this to you. For flesh and blood, sorry, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay, so here's Peter before the day of Pentecost. What, what has happened to him? He's gone through regeneration. He's gone through the Holy Spirit experience where that heart of stone is taken out and a heart of belief is put in. So you have to distinguish in your theology the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was yet to come, or the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, which, is, which was yet to come, and being saved and being regenerated. They're not the same thing. The Pentecostals are right on that issue. Okay, so what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit then? I don't see the contradiction. You don't see the contradiction. I don't. Just because there's not a contradiction. Well, what do you mean? Just because the Holy Spirit wasn't poured out into the entire world at that time doesn't mean that God didn't use the Holy Spirit to pluck out people. Yeah, of course. So what's the problem? The the problem is is this all happens prior to the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. prior to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So you're saying these guys like Peter were regenerated, mm -hmm. and then at Pentecost. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay. And 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 we're going to see that it specifically says to them, wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I, okay, I'll, you know, I'll finish because I'm guessing that you're going to continue and and say what I'm thinking anyway. Okay. All right. I, I want to make sure that that we're all on the same page. All I'm saying is that there are that you can be saved at least. At least under the Old Testament, you can be saved and not have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's still Acts 2. That's still John 7 says, no one has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as of yet. So then what's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so let's get down to that. Does that make sense? Are we, do you understand that? Do you understand that? Is that a case for that, do you think? And the Pentecostals would push on that. The Pentecostals would push on this, right? The Pentecostals would say, "Would say, see, you can be saved. When was Peter saved? But then, when was he baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost?" Because baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't save you, though. No, you and already they saved. That, they would say that it doesn't save you. A Pentecostal, unless you're dealing with an errant like uh, the UPC, then they would say that no, it doesn't save you. Right. You're saved well, before. Then yes. I still don't have a so <clears throat> is that the line then in regards to the old and the new covenant? Would that be proper to look at it that way? Or? I would say that that's 
part of the Old and New Covenant. I wouldn't say that's completely everything of the New Covenant, but I think the New Covenant is, yes, the Spirit's poured out in a way that wasn't poured out or was poured out only somewhat under the Old Testament, under yeah. the Old Covenant. Selectively. Yeah, selectively. Mm-hmm. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> but this is not Acts. What, what's happened here is not Acts 2. I know. No. Okay, so. I got you. Okay, all right. All I'm right. just three steps ahead of you, I think. Okay, good, good, good. All right, so let's talk about the prophecy of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Luke chapter 3 and verse 15. Chapter 3 and verse 15, Uh, let's see, and verse 16, sorry. And John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Jesus is the one who's doing the baptism and he's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. And this is still future from here, but he's saying he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Um, There's a couple places in the Old Testament where Moses is ministering and some of the people under Moses is ministering and they start performing these miracles. And Moses says, well, I wish everybody was like this. I wish everybody was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I wish everybody. And then and then in Joel chapter 2, which we'll pick up in Acts chapter 2, in Joel chapter 2 says there's a prophecy that says the day is coming when everybody will receive the Spirit. The old, the young people, um, your maidservants, females, males, old, young, will receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's prophecy up till then. Now, also prophecy is turn to Luke chapter 20, last chapter, chapter 24. Okay, I lost the, the place in Luke where he prophesies about the, the coming. He says, you'll receive power from on high. Am I not in the right spot? Does anybody see that? I'm sorry, I lost the verse. Where it says what? You'll receive power from on high. In a few days from now, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh all right, I'm sorry. I, I don't know where that verse is. I thought I had written it down, but I didn't. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Same author. In verse 8. Verse 49. It is verse. Okay, will you read that, please? I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Okay, so stay in the city till you're clothed. Now that's that's a euphemism for what he promised, what John the Baptist promised. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And look at verse 8 of Acts chapter 1. It says, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Okay, so now he's so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is new covenant power to fill out the 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 great commission of Christ. Okay, that's the power that's given to us to overthrow the demonic forces to uh, to preach in Christ's name, and that's coming now later with these people. And then you get to Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together 
in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire uh, appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them as the Spirit gave them utterance. And verses five through um, thirteen, uh, they're they're praising God. Look at verse five here. It says, "Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, the Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And the sound of the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language, and were amazed and astonished, saying." Are not all these men speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our native tongue, in our native language? And then they accuse them of being drunk. And then in verse 14, now this is the fulfillment of everything that, that's come before. So this is new stuff for them. This is new for them. This is not salvation. This is not regeneration. This is not conversion. This is brand new for them. This is the pouring out that was promised of the Holy Spirit. But Peter, standing with the eleven, stood up and addressed the men. He said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you have supposed, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what is nine in the morning-ish. Uh, but this is what, it's, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So now he says that this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. This is the fulfillment of what was uttered by the prophet Joel. And in the last days there shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall receive visions. Your old men will dream dreams even on my male servants and on my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and, there, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven and signs on earth below, and blood, fire, and vapor, and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon uh, to blood, before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's point one. I want to see, I want you to see point one. Point one is that this event, this Acts 2 event, is distinguished between regeneration and faith. It is distinguished between regeneration and faith. To get a further sense of that, turn to Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> And verse 4. Um, well, I'll summarize here because we're running low on time. But in Acts chapter 8, uh, you, have the, you have Philip um, preaching to the Samaritans. Okay, he's preaching to the Samaritans. Uh, but the, and they get saved. They, they get they they believe and then Peter comes down because this is the first time the gospel is going outside this Jewish community it's, so it's a significant event but when Peter comes down he sees that they have that they're saved that they're believers but they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and if you look at verse 14 it says now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans who had received the word of God sent they sent to him, to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. Okay, so let me let me just ask you this question. It's not the same yet. Okay, it's not it's distinguishable. Someone can have the inward work of regeneration to bring them to faith. They can believe in Christ, but now the question is. But the 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 point I'm trying to make is distinguished. They're not the same. Now here's the biggest question. Now here's the, the, the $64 million. This is what we're all fighting over. From now on, does everybody who believes have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's the big question now. Does everybody from here on out 
have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if they do, what do we do with this Acts chapter 8 event? Because these people don't. And this is where the, um, uh, the Pentecostals are going to push on the gas, and this is where I'm going to fight back. So let me tell you, I'm going to say, I'm going to say um, uh, yes, but I, I am going to leave that to your conscience to decide. Okay, I'm going to leave that to your, because there are many good men who do not believe that who believe that this empowerment, not all Christians have this empowerment, but I'm going to say everybody who's been saved now has been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And let me give you an example of the error that the, that the, that the Pentecostal and the charismatic position make. I'm going to give you an example of the error, and then I'm going to seek to justify um, that through Scripture. Here's the example of the error, okay? And it has to do with pushing the ball of redemption forward. So under the Old Covenant... When people died, where did they go? Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. Paradise. Paradise. Now that Christ has died, risen again, ascended into heaven, now where do we go? Up or down. Throne of God. Yeah, yeah, where do Christians go? <laughs> huh? To the throne room of God. Would it make any sense to argue from that's what happened? When you died, you went there, and then people were there, and then they went into heaven, right? Now, would it make any sense to say, okay, so now we've got a pattern. So when you die, you'll first go to Abraham's bosom, and then you'll go to heaven. You'd be like, no, no, the ball of redemption has been pushed forward in a significant way. And now that the ball of redemption is pushed forward in that way, that's not just because that was the pattern then doesn't mean that's the pattern today. Okay, so then here's the second illustration. John's baptism. John's baptism came before Christ's baptism and ran parallel along with Christ's baptism, right? And many of the disciples were baptized by John first and then baptized by Jesus afterwards. So you should be. We should have two baptisms. We should have the baptism of John. Didn't the disciples get baptized by John first? Yeah. And didn't they then go over to the Christian baptism? Yeah. So that's a pattern of history, right? You should be baptized by John. Then you should be baptized by Jesus in the baptism of Jesus. Now, would that wash with you today? No, no, no. Why not? I mean, I've got a pattern of history. Peter and Andrew were baptized by John, and then Peter and Andrew were baptized by Jesus. And then you should do that, right? You should be baptized in John's baptism, then baptism in Jesus's baptism. We've moved on. We've moved on, right? You would say that the pattern of history, now that it's moved on, has established a new pattern because of the the because of the work of redemption has moved forward okay now here's the question then how do we know that the pattern of history has moved on right because if you're just here and you're looking at these verses pentecostalism looks pretty good like well I, I, i'm saved and i know some people who are more empowered for ministry and, than others so how do we tell then that the position that now today all Christians who have been all Christians who are saved have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. How do we tell? It better be in there. Huh? It better be in there. It better be in the Word. It better be in the Word. Let me just say that. Uh, let me digress for just a minute and just say, uh, what does it take to make a doctrine? If I say, well, I've got a doctrine in the Bible. What do I need? I need, I've said this before. You need three things. You better have three of them. You better have at least one. You don't have one. So let me give you this one, an example. And then what's the next one? A teaching. Okay, I'll say, I'll leave teaching for last. A practice. Uh, a command. Oh, a command. A command, okay. So in order for us to, you, there better be an example in the Bible, there better be a command in the Bible, and there better be a teaching in the Bible somewhere. Now, some people, you just have an example or you just have a command. That's like writing down the rapids on, in, with, with, one, with, uh, with one log. Okay, could you imagine writing down the rapids? You're going to get, you know, you're writing down there and you've just got one log to hold on to. And you're, oh, 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 oh. You know, you can do it. You can hold on to it. But you, the problem is, is you, if you don't have all three, you can kind of get yourself into some trouble, especially if one contradicts the other, doesn't contradict, but seems to, I'll just say that. The Bible doesn't contradict itself, but if one contradicts the other. So an example is uh, Mary was 
uh, Mary conceived Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, that's an example. So should we have the conceiving children by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, without a male counterpart today? You'd say, well, no, because you just have an example of that. Okay, you could have a command too. A command could be, uh, go and, you know, they said, go and kill all the men, women, and children. So we go out and we kill all the men, women, and children, right? Of the people who don't believe today. That was a command back in the Old Testament. You'd say, mm -mm, not so much. The big deal is what's the teaching on this? You've got to have a teaching, and then you've got to have all of them to make a big, solid doctrine. This is why I gave up infant baptism, by the way. This is why uh, the, the pre-tribulational rapture thing is a, is a hoax. We don't have any of this. There's no teaching on it. There's no command on it. There's, there's none of that on it. It's all, it's all imp implied. They try to get it from an impl implication. Okay, so here's the deal. And this is why I fall down on the side is that all the teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit says that all Christians today have it. All Christians today have it. And that's where the teaching is. So I understand that, but I've got to come up with a reason why we have examples and commands that seem to contradict it, right? I got to come up with, there's got to be a paradigm in which these things fit and flow. And that paradigm is, let's see, well, no, we've got some time. We got a deep breath, deep breath. So let's look at Acts chapter two. I'll give you plenty of time to jump up and wiggle around here. Speak in tongues. I'm going to jump up and wiggle around. He's going to go roll around in the hallway. Yeah, he's going to go, yeah. Get this flag. We hear any barking. Okay. So, <laughs> I will say the pushing forward of all Christians starting to have this starts here right here in Acts chapter 2. Because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, read this prophecy again. It says, And in the last days there shall be, God declares, I will pour out my flesh on all, all our, yeah, my spirit on all flesh. Now, while I think that all flesh, I mean, all flesh, that needs to be, there needs to be some interpretation there, but I just don't see all flesh meaning some Christians especially an elite group of Christians and the non-elite non group of Christians. So at least... I checked, all means all. Most of the time. Most of the time. So, so, so we can see that, the, that the, the aim of this, anyway, is that everybody should have this. That's the aim of it, to happen, okay? That's, that's where it's going here, okay? You know, I'll pour out my flesh on all, on all... I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And it says, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy... And your young man shall see visions, and your old man shall have dreams. And so he's giving categories, young, old, female, male. There's no distinguishment anymore. There's not just a select group of prophets or a select group of people in which God kind of acts. We all have new covenant administrative power. Uh, and he says, and then in verse 21, look at verse 21, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the spirit uh, the name of the lord shall be saved. So now he ties in this with salvation. Okay? He ties this in with salvation. And if you look over in uh, chapter chapter 2 st still in verse 38, it says and Peter said to them, repent. Now here's the the command, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will, will receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we can see, now the ball's not, now we're still only in Acts chapter 2, the ball's got to roll over what happens at the Samaritan. But can you see that there's the ball of redemption? You can see where this ball's going, right? It's going, it's going to say all, right? All people who are going to be saved, all people who are saved, are going to receive this. That's where it's headed. Okay, so we've got a transition period here from the old covenant to the new covenant. And by the time the new covenant comes in full force, everybody's received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That, um, that, I mean, I, I, I think that your prophecy from Joel says it. Right yes. There. But when you say it for in the next passage where it says... Um, 
In verse 38? Yeah, wherever, wherever it says that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It mm -hmm. doesn't, unless the Greek says something different, unless the structure of the sentences ties it in, that can still be later. You can't say, well, oh, you yes. have to have it right yeah, now. Yeah, you will eventually receive yeah. it. But they, yeah, the Pentecostal, that's a good point. That's a good point. I'm going to answer that point by yeah. turning to a different, different verse. In, in verse chapter 12, in chapter 12, and verse, um, sorry, no, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And, and by the way, that is the kind of argumentation which I said, I will leave that up to your conscience. Because some people say you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There could be a lag time. However, I, wouldn't, I, I cannot say that there are people who have received it and people who haven't. I just, it just doesn't seem to be that way f uh, for me. But that's the kind of thing that a Dr. Morey that uh, would would argue for right there. Would he would say put his foot down on that? All right. In twelve twelve it says, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, the, through many are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So the teaching here, the teaching here is what gets you in the church is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You are placed in the body of Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the new covenant reality of the church versus the old covenant shadow of Israel. So you're coming into the body through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you, you know, you've got not a good translation there. I'm sorry. Your, your says it's baptized by the Holy Spirit. No, because it got crossed out and the word in is written. Oh, you did. Okay, all right. <laughs> it so has the, been the, repaired the, and the, fixed. The, and the NIV translates this, this Greek word right here <laughs> is by. Wait, no, where it says it? And it's not. That's the word in and it means in. And, and I don't know why they did that other than maybe they leaned Pentecostal and they didn't want to have that word by there or they didn't want to have the word in there. But they will say, by the Holy Spirit. And they'll say, well, that's the different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and they make a big deal out of that. They do have a footnote, though, that says, or with, or in. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're about to close it up here. Any questions on this before we close this up and get on to our... Yeah. Me blathering on some more about some other stuff. Awesome. The passage that you read about um, John and Peter, I think going to administer the Holy Spirit to the Samaritans, Samaritans mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, wouldn't you say that when something is brand new, the very first time something major happens, like the gospel goes away from the Jewish community, mm -hmm. that something big always precedes that so that it's, it's a major issue? So when you have a really big, huge, like, Old Testament miracle mm -hmm. and 300,000 people become Christians suddenly. Mm -hmm. That's the first time that happened, right? Yes. So I don't think that you can say because of that passage that now we have to have a separate event because in that time it was a first event mm -hmm. and now it's not a first event. This Holy Spirit has been loosed onto the world. I would I would argue that exact reasoning that it's here now. Yeah. That now the ball and and the delay comes from remember what Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and Samaria and the Gentiles and to the end of the earth. And so each one of those you'll see have a Pentecostal experience right. in so, the book of Acts. Okay, right. And as time goes on, the ball's moving forward and that delay is getting shorter and shorter and shorter until it's it's immediate at, for the Jewish community after that, people who get saved automatically receive the, the, yeah. the, the but as Spirit. it goes out yep. the world as the Spirit's being poured out the delay gets shorter and shorter until it's instantaneous you, you do hear sometimes of those kind of Pentecostal events when missionaries yeah. go to a, a tribe or, or somewhere in yeah. Russia that never received it and all uh -huh. of a sudden you know, people are filled with joy. But it's the first things time. happening. Yeah. They haven't had it before. So yeah, that, I would, that could be that could be part of the pattern. That that that's definitely part of it. I would say that's definitely part of the pattern. I would say for sure, one hundred percent. And when you say it's been 
poured out on all flesh, that all flesh all means all, because it's all flesh. It is all flesh, because it doesn't have any qualifiers like all who believe, you know what I mean? Right. So wouldn't that tie into special and, and general revelation? Everybody has some kind of experience with the Holy Spirit because we have this general revelation. And that's the Holy Spirit speaking to people, right? Um, I would not, I would have to think about that. I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking or in what way or if there's any qualifiers on that. After one of those I, verses, the following verses was talking I, about who the Lord had called. Oh, after, the, say, all, after the Joel prophecy? Yeah, I would more say that has to do with where, where males, females, slave, free, okay. and then all tribe, tongue, and nation that we see in the book of Revelation. Right. All of the chosen. But yeah. still, it's still, <laughs> that, that makes sense to me, but it's still speculation. All right. I want to be good talk. Well, well, we'll pick up the discussion I'm on this yet. next time. 239, uh, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, your, our God, will call. Yeah. Yes. 39? Yep. Okay, I know I just read that. Good eyes. No, she had okay. bad eyes. She has to wear bifocals. Awesome. Good insight. That, that, <laughs> yeah, because 38 is what is like, you, is... Forgiveness yep. of your sins. No, you're right. That fixes very it. next verse. Like, it is not. It's for who he's called. Good job. See, the Holy Spirit's poured out. It's not just me. It's all of you. We all have the ability to prophesy and teach and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> Ashton, we, oh, sorry, I wasn't here last week. Did you? Did you differ? Have you talked about prophecy specifically? No, not yet. Okay. No, we're still just talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll talk yeah, about we the gifts. Chapter, and then we, we don't move that fast, listening. Um, Ashton, will you pray for us? That's supposed. Okay. Lord, thank you that we're able to come together as a family, to dig into your word, and get to understand it more. Get to know you more and draw closer to you, Lord. I thank you for this small little community of family that we're able to get together and do this. And I just have to say thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Give Ian the wisdom he needs to preach the message here in a few moments, and that he doesn't have a Freudian slip. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Pray for that too. Thank you. All right. Oops.